Fantastic. This is Steve Conklin, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog, calling this work session meeting for Wednesday, June 1st, 2022 to order. Uh, and Melinda, I believe you've got attendance based on the logins. Yes, and I do. At this point, we will move to public comment if there's any public comment. Melinda, do you see anyone wanting to make a public comment or should we move ahead? I do not. Okay, thank you. Uh, the summary of the May 4th, 2022 board work session uh, is attached. Uh, does anyone have any changes or concerns with that summary? Okay, awesome. And with that, uh, we will move ahead to item number four, the joint purchasing program at the Houston Galveston Area Council or HGAC, HGAC, uh, and Flo Rotana will uh, kind of lead the presentation on that. Flo. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I would like to welcome to the meeting tonight, Ronnie Barnes um, and Marlena Mack. They are both with the Houston Galveston Area Council. And they're gonna to talk to us about their joint purchasing program called HGAC Buy. And, and this is uh, one of the strategic plan elements that we presented at the board <coughs> on April 2nd. And the board expressed interest in it. And, and so we, we have the presentation from, from uh, Ronnie and, and um, uh, Marlena. So Ronnie, if you wanna present. Will do. I'm gonna try try to share my screen here. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Good. So good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the board. My name is Ronnie Barnes. I'm the director of the public services department at the Houston Galveston Area Council. Uh, and one of my responsibility is to oversee the cooperative purchasing program that HGAC administers that's trademarked and named HGAC by. The HGAC has nothing to do with the Houston Galveston Area Council. HGAC by stands for helping governments across the country buy. Which we had to trademark it because we used to get answered when we were in other places, why would I want to buy something from Houston or Galveston? Uh, so thus we have have the helping it governments across the, by, across the country by trademark. Uh, I'm gonna go through the presentation uh, and I'd be happy to field any questions you might have along the way, or if you'd like to wait until the end. Uh, the Houston Galveston Area Council Cooperative Purchasing Program is a nationwide program. Uh, we've been in existence for over 45 years, serving local governments. We have more than 900 vendors who hold individual contracts to provide products, equipment, and services to our members. And we have more than 8,000 members across the country. We actually have a member in every state of the union. Uh, we only have one in Hawaii, and we could get more if my boss would let me go more often. But uh, I'm still working on that. Uh, what we offer as a cooperative purchasing program is competitively solicited contracts. Those contracts are solicited the same way a local uh, municipality may do. We have to follow the Texas local government statute to advertise them and to hold pre-bid conferences and to have seal competitive responses supplied. We have evaluation committee that evaluates them. We take those contracts to our board and our board approves them uh, or disproves them, which we've never had them not approve any one of them. Uh, and then we establish the contracts and then we're able to offer over 40 different categories of contracts for product, products and services to our membership. One of the other things we offer is we are in contract with those suppliers. And so we have a set of compliance measures that we ensure that they meet, making sure they give you the contract price, making sure that they're giving you the contracted delivery uh, and not doing things that would get any of us in trouble uh, with, with, with the powers that be. Some of the other benefits of the program is we have a no cost 
evergreen membership, uh, meaning that when when somebody becomes a member of HGAC, that their membership is evergreen, it renews itself automatically every year unless either party decides not to continue with the membership. There's no fee, no membership dues associated with our program. Once you become a member, you're a member until you decide you don't want to be a member and there's no cost to you. Um, <clears throat> one of the other big, big advantages is that you get discount volume pricing. We have 8,000 members and we've got 900 vendors and we sell products and services through our contracts all across the country. So the volume of activity associated with the cooperative drives the price down uh, considerably. Uh, and, it, and, and our price is the starting price. You can always negotiate that price and ask that vendor for a discount to get an even better price. One of the other big things is the soft cost savings. So every purchasing operation does not have staff that can uh, take dedicated time to write a spec, put that spec out to bid, do the evaluation, uh, make the award recommendation and <clears throat> maintain that contract through its term. Uh, there's a lot of cost associated with that. We've seen some numbers where they could take uh, up to four to six months to, to process that according to what you're buying. Uh, and the cost associated with that, we can save that cost because we've already done that work. <clears throat> and another big advantage is we are the repository uh, and the defenders of the solicitation documents. We have those documents available for review at any time on our website, and we can walk anyone who wants to take a look at them through the process to make sure that we're satisfying whatever requirements they think we should have followed. We can always demonstrate to them what we have done. Uh, there are a couple of statutes that we followed for membership. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the one is the Texas Interlocal Cooper Cooper Cooperation Act. Uh, that's Title Seven, Chapter 791 of the Texas Local Government Code that says that uh, to make purchases or provide purchasing services with any other local government this act authorizes us to do that from the state of Texas. And on your side, Title 24, Article 110 in the Intergovernmental Relations is the statute that gives us both the authority to participate in the cooperative and in the membership in our cooperative purchasing program. So last year, 2021, our cooperative purchasing program processed $2.1 billion in products and services through, through our, from January 2021 through December 31st of 2021. <clears throat> that, that encompassed about 4,000 separate transactions that our team processed for member governments that are part of uh, the HGAC by uh, membership. Um, we charge a flat fee to our vendors or a administrative fee to our vendors each time they access our contract to make a purchase to, to, to make a sale to any of our members. And we invoice our membership, through our, our vendors directly for that, that administrative fee. What you see on the graph here is uh, a list of some of the other partners that we have, um, the Mid-America Regional Council, the Baltimore, Baltimore Metropolitan Council, uh, the San Diego, San Clemente Area Council of Governments and Association, the Municipal Association of South Carolina uh, are all members that we partner with. And in that partnership, we share the administrative fee with those partners uh, to provide a service for them to offer to their membership to be able to purchase through the cooperative. Um, the fee split usually is we take two thirds of the fee and because of the efforts to promote the program and support the program on your on the partner side, we share one third of that fee with them. And our average fee is somewhere between 1.5 uh, is the flat fee 
And then we have a flat fee schedule. So when you average this out, the weighted fee average is about 0.75 that we charge them at $2.1 billion. And that's how we generate revenue to operate our program and provide the services that we offer to our membership. We do quite a bit of outreach with our partners and for ourselves. Uh, we have what's called a virtual open house where we instituted this program back in 2020, right at the very beginning of COVID. Uh, we couldn't go anywhere and we participate in several conferences and exhibits. So we built a program that will allow through a, a virtual process to have our vendors present their products and services to members who might be interested. Uh, and that's been quite successful. We do three or four of these a month uh, and we found that it was so successful, we've decided to maintain it through post COVID. Uh, we attend about 20 different conferences across the country every year, NIGP, uh, Parks and Recreation, American Public Works, um, the fire department instructors conference in Indianapolis, and we usually have a booth there uh, to support our vendors that are exhibiting there as well. And with our partners, we try and have an event so they can uh, bring their membership and expose them to the cooperative purchasing program that they may not have been exposed before, or they want to learn something else that we offer and we do that jointly. You can see on the, on the screen here, we've got one scheduled June 15th with our Baltimore partner, one in June 21st with our Mid-America partner, and then one with our South Carolina partner, June 22nd. As a member, uh, a partner with us, we create a landing page on our website. So anytime uh, your membership wants to take a look at what the relationship is between Dr. Cog and HCAC or any other of our partners, we create a landing page where we can put information out there that you might want to share with, them, with your members about how they go about participating. We also offer virtual sessions every month uh, to inform members on how to actually use the program. We have a co-branded event as the one I described in the previous uh, slide uh, where we have a uh, expo or some sort of event to where we make a big deal out of what membership with HGAC by and with uh, this partnership would look like. And then we have other initiatives that we have uh, throughout the year, mailers, videos, uh, social media campaigns that we uh, offer as outreach as well. And that's a real high level of what the program is and, and the membership and partnership opportunity that we've been talking with Flo uh, about. To, and here are our contacts, myself, Brian Denzel, who is also uh, the manager of our cooperative purchasing program, and then our superwoman. And, the, uh, and I, my go-to for our partnership engagement is Marlena Mack. And you have our contact information here. And finally, there's a look at our website address as well as our handles for our social media platforms that we participate. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to field any questions you guys may have. I see someone has their hand up. Thank you. And we'll get to the questions in just a second. And just a reminder, this is, is looking at a possibility from what our conversation was about the strategic initiatives uh, coming out of the retreat. So this is kind of a, a starting point to us having some thoughts or, or conversations about this. Uh, Director Jeslin, or Director, I, I, I'm not saying your last name right. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Um, so I thanks for sharing this is helpful information. I'd love to learn a little bit more about how do you ensure women and minority owned businesses aren't left behind in this process? I see uh, Commissioner Spear shaking her head as well. So I think a couple of us have that question. So in our solicitation, we 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 ask the part of what's in the solicitation 
is the affirmative steps that are placed in uh, 2 CFR 200 uh, about ensuring that there are opportunities provided to uh, small business, women-owned business, uh, minority-owned businesses as well. Now, it's tricky because there are, most of our contractors are large manufacturers that can supply across the country, but there's opportunity to partner with their dealers and their resellers in the specific areas that they operate. And so we make every effort to ensure that they are included. We ask that every responded to our solicitation provide us with their plan to include minority and women-owned businesses in, in the administration of the contract that they may be awarded. Um, so, so we make up a, a full earnest effort to make sure that we're being inclusionary in the, in the opportunities. The nature of the, of the business that we're working with, fire apparatus, for, for instance, uh, there aren't very many minority or women-owned uh, dealers or resellers in that space but we do make the effort to include them wherever we can. And just one follow-up, just out of curiosity, is that if there's a, an express plan, does that gain like additional points and like the rating system, like how does that, you know, how does that sort of support that effort? It, it, so it, in the cumulative uh, score uh, mm -hmm. for the evaluation, there's consideration given in the scoring criteria. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. You're welcome. Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate this presentation. Um, I understand that the products offered uh, or products and services offered are very broad in nature. Could you tell us a little bit more about the types of things we might see and be able to purchase? Sure. Most, most of the equipment and services are big ticket items, fire trucks, ambulances, earth moving equipment, police vehicles, uh, street maintenance equipment. Um, trying to think of some of the other great big ones. Uh, uh, no plows. Ref, ref, refuge handling equipment, garbage trucks, uh, sewer jet cleaning trucks things of that nature. So there are a lot of capital intensive equipment. Some of the services that we provide or temporary staffing, uh, uh, mm -hmm. all hazards planning and, prep and, and planning for disaster recovery, uh, that service is offered as well. We have a marketing and outreach contract, contract where we offer marketing services as well. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Rex, sorry about that. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ronnie, uh, Doug Rex with Dr. Cog. Thank, I wanna thank you and Marlena for, for uh, jumping on with us today. I think you're, this is a great presentation, a good, good starting point for us. As the, as the chair mentioned, um, you know, we're beginning to explore options and this is one of, you know, a possible, I think cooperatives are a good example of, uh, you know, it's just collaborative work that we do as regional councils throughout the region, or throughout the, the country. And, and I just want to thank you so much for, for jumping on. I will, I will tell you, I'm going to see, I'm going to see the boss. I'm going to see Chuck Wemple in a couple of weeks. So I'm definitely going to put a plug in for you, for, for, uh, for you going to Hawaii a, couple, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate right? that. <laughs> I don't know what his problem is. Hey, you I'll, know, I'll, I'll straighten him out. Oh, I appreciate. It. I, I'll I'll be there as well, Doug, at, at, in in Columbus. So so oh, good. I, I, I'll 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 make sure to queue it up for you. <laughs> Sounds great, my friend. Listen, I did have a question. Um, have you know in through the years, and I know you all have been doing this for forty five years, which is just simply amazing to me. Um, have you come across uh, situations in which there are uh, restrictions in state law that have prohibited? maybe communities from participating in this program? I'm just curious. We haven't done our research on this side yet, so I was just a little curious. There, there are some uh, states uh, that, that limit uh, what you can do. State of Mississippi comes to mind. Uh, part of that is that they've partnered with another cooperative at the state level. Uh, uh, and so they restrict the use of cooperatives 
within their state. Uh, state of Louisiana has done the same thing. Uh, but the, what we're seeing is that the municipalities in the, the local governments have started to flex their sovereignty. Uh, and as long as they're using uh, local dollars or if they're using federal dollars where applicable, they, they've started to buck that trend a bit. Okay, interesting. No, thank yeah. you, sir, very much. Sure. Director Dyack. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, you know, this is a, an interesting uh, program. Um, we, we are policy, and um, this is more of an operational or staff-driven um, approach, at least, you know, from, from my perspective. So um, I'm supportive of continuing the conversation. I, I think uh, maybe Dr. Cog's staff should, should use the city manager uh, meeting to take the temperature of, of our town administrators, city managers, or county managers to, to identify their interest or, or potential issues with, with this as we continue the, the conversation. I think some, uh, some case studies in terms of how, how we can potentially utilize this service and what the cost savings are um, would, would be helpful. Um, so to me, I think, um, you know, I think we're, we're kind of out, of out of position, so to speak, as policymakers here at the Dr. Cog Board. Um, but, you know, we, we certainly rely and trust our staff here at Dr. Cog. And if, if they see value, I would just encourage them to, uh, to reach out to our, our staff and continue that conversation to see if it's viable. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Great. Mr. Barnes and Ms. Mack, any further uh, closing comments from you? Uh, other than let's say I, this is, as Flo mentioned, and some of you have mentioned, a starting point. Uh, it's an opportunity that we're exploring. And so we're, we are very uh, open to walking that path with you guys. Need more information from us. Uh, if you just reach out to either of us uh, uh, listed here, we would be more than happy to respond as quickly as we can to get you the information you need to, to, to further your consideration. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, We've, we've talked to, been talking with Flo for a while, um, and I know Doug has talked with my boss, Chuck Wimple. And uh, so we, we, we're happy to have the conversation at least. Great. Well, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate your, uh, your time and your presentation. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Moving ahead on the agenda, the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, or the 2050 RTP, a Greenhouse Gas Analysis. Mr. Reeker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me just a moment to share my screen. Okay, hopefully folks are seeing that in presentation mode. All right, we wanted to, um, we've been coming to you each month um, kind of as, as we've been doing the work and kind of keeping you abreast of where we're at and what we think the road ahead looks like. So we wanted to give you this monthly update, um, kind of level set on where we're, where we're at uh, with the greenhouse gas analysis for our 2050 regional transportation plan. So we're gonna start out with some high points. I'm gonna highlight these first three. By now, these are probably mostly review points for you. Um, so I won't emphasize these strongly, but just as a quick reminder, you've heard me say before that based on the deadline in the rule, um, the board, our board needs to adopt the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, the revised plan um, by October 1st, incorporating all the analysis that we've been doing. Um, we've talked about how the, the state greenhouse gas rule defines the baseline, which is the 2050 regional transportation plan as it was adopted and as it was modeled at the time of adoption back in April of 2021. And then we've also talked about the concept that the emission reduction target amounts are from the baseline. So the rule specifies those amounts. I'll show you those one more time um, that we need to reduce for each analysis here. And those reduction amounts are from the baseline uh, that we calculate from the plan at adoption. 
So based on that background, um, our adopted 2050 plan, we think can achieve about 70 to 80% of the reduction targets with some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, and then I'll remind you uh, again of today uh, regarding telework adjustments and particularly in quantifying uh, what we call the programmatic investments in the plan or the non-project specific investments in the plan. Um, we're currently testing, and again, for each of those, I'll give you more detail in this presentation. We're currently testing some strategic modifications to the 2050 plan's project investment mix. Um, and I'll talk about that and, and kind of what we mean by that. Um, but even when we do that, based on our initial analysis, we'll still have a reduction gap. In other words, we won't still quite get all the way to our, uh, to our targets. Um, so two additional things that we're looking at, and again, I'll talk about these in more detail as well, um, land use forecast adjustments and mitigation measures, which are specified in the SAGE HD rule. So that's kind of the overview of, of the topics for today. Um, you know, look, this is really complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. It's very confusing. Um, we appreciate that it's probably confusing to you. It's even confusing to us as staff sometimes. So we wanted to try and put together something that hopefully, you know, kind of distills a little bit in overall kind of process framework um, of, you know, what we think we're doing, what the logical steps are, and kind of where this is going. So I'm going to show this to you at both the beginning um, and the end of this presentation. We've been focusing so far um, in our updates to you on first Number one, the RTP baseline, again, how the baseline is defined and the calculation of the actual baseline values. We've been talking about number two, um, which is um, the work that staff has done over the past several months to make sure that all of the investments in the plan, in our multimodal 2050 plan are reflected as much as we can possibly reflect in our uh, transportation modeling. Um, again, particularly those non-project specific programmatic investments um, and telework, which we've talked about in previous meetings. So that's step two. We're now in step three, and this is what we're gonna talk about today, um, the sort of um, project specific um, investment changes that we're considering and testing as part of this work um, and what that does for us. Um, and then we're also gonna to touch on step four, which is once we do all of these things, um, and you know, if we're not quite there and we think that we won't be quite there, even with all the things that we've talked about so far, um, then what, is that, what does that mean in terms of mitigation measures and a mitigation action plan? So again, I'll show this to you at the end, but I wanted to give you that framework of what we're talking about and how these things relate to each other. Um, so this table you've seen before, this is just a reminder, this comes straight uh, from the state rule, from the greenhouse gas rule. As a reminder, what it's showing is the reduction amounts, the greenhouse gas emission reduction results that we need to meet in the 2050 plan uh, for several analysis years, as you see. Um, these are amounts that are in million metric tons, and they're specified for us in the rule for 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. This table, because it's in the rule, it's covering the entire state. These, um, these reduction amounts and this requirement applies to each of the five MPOs in the state, and it also applies to CDOT in the non-MPO areas of the state. So for us, the numbers we're focusing on are obviously the Dr. Cog numbers um, on the top row. Those are the actual amounts, again, in million metric tons that we need to reduce in the 2050 plan uh, for each of these analysis years. So again, I said we start at the baseline. Uh, we need to define what the baseline is, and that gives us a starting point for how far we need to go. So I think you may have seen a version of this table. This is an updated version. Uh, just kind of show you the latest and greatest. Um, so first, the kind of first row there, again, showing the analysis here is, and then the greenhouse gas baseline, um, again, an annual million metric tons. This is our calculation of the baseline for each analysis here, based on, again, the 2050 plan as modeled at adoption back in April of 2021. So that's what that first set of numbers is, the 14.64, 9.23, and so on. The second number is the reduction target amounts. This is what I just showed you in the previous slide. This comes from the rule. Um, these are the amounts that we need to reduce by for each analysis year. So now we know our baseline, where we're starting from, and we, need, and we know how much we need to reduce for each analysis year according to the rule. And then the third line here is the percent reduction required from the baseline. So when you put those two things together, now we can say that for 2025, for example, we need to reduce about 1.8%. For 2030, it's about 8.9%. And for 2040 and 2050, it's about 10%. So that's kind of our framework for the analysis that we've been doing. 
So we've talked about um, the programmatic investments. Again, this is a reminder. These are things that are a significant part of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, both in terms of kind of the content of the plan, uh, but as well the fiscal constraint, the financial plan investments within the plan. Because it's a 30-year plan, we certainly identify the major multimodal projects, what I'd call the lines or the dots on a map, for sure. And we list those and we map those in the plan. But we recognize that there's a whole lot of what I'd call connective tissue related to our multimodal transportation system that it takes to operate, maintain, evolve, expand, run, um, et cetera, our transportation system. So you see some of these major categories listed here. Um, I won't go through each of them, but the idea is that these are things that are in the plan. They may not be defined yet as specific projects. We don't identify every specific sidewalk or every specific transit service enhancement, um, every single safety project, but they're really important components of the plan. And a big thing that we've been working on, as you've heard me say in past meetings, is we don't typically model these things when we're kind of doing our air quality conformity modeling and our, and our federally required modeling for plan adoption. So a big part of this for the GHG rule is to come back and say, how can we reasonably capture, capture the benefits of the greenhouse gas benefits of these investments that are part and parcel of our plan? They're included in our plan. As I said, they're included in our financial plan. How can we reasonably but justifiably um, sort of analyze and quantify the GHG benefits associated with these investments? Um, in addition to doing that work sort of from a technical and a modeling side, I did want to highlight that one of the things we've been doing, and we did this when we uh, first developed the 2050 plan, we started, uh, we pioneered a couple of groups when we first prepared the plan, the Civic Advisory Group and the Youth Advisory Panel. We've actually re-engaged our, re our Civic Advisory Group, and this is a group that includes folks either directly or uh, folks who work with uh, vulnerable populations or underrepresented populations. We specifically formed this group to hear that perspective, um, to give those folks a direct, you know, sort of input and pipeline into our planning process. We met with them several times when we were originally preparing uh, the 2050 plan back a couple of years ago. Uh, we've reconvened this group and have already met with them a couple of times in planning the third meeting as we work through this GHD analysis. And we last met with them in mid-May, and we went through an exercise with them on those programmatic investments. We wanted their input and their perspective about um, kind of how they feel about the different types of categories of programmatic investments and what rings true for them from their perspective in their community. So it wasn't quite a budget game. We didn't put it in dollars. We did more about voting and, and sort of prioritization. But what we did is we did a voting exercise with them kind of before and after. We had them take kind of an initial vote when we showed the strategies. And then we kind of talked through it with them um, and had, had group conversation and reflection. And then we did kind of a second vote at the end. As you see, the results are pretty similar. Um, but I think the key takeaway is noted here is that one of the big things we heard from them is that they recognize the importance and support the importance of greenhouse gas emission reductions, but they particularly keyed in on some of these programmatic investments that also help build community, things like sidewalks, things like transit service, tangible things that, you know, can kind of, you know, do two things at once, can help reduce GHG emissions, um, but also kind of build up and invest in um, their communities. And so that was an important thing for us to hear. Um, so now as we kind of pivot into, you know, knowing that we've done this programmatic investment work, the telework, um, some of the other things is sort of the initial analysis, um, recognizing again that gets us about 70 to 80 percent of the way there. We know that these programmatic strategies by themselves will not fully achieve the GHG targets. So lately we've been testing what I'd call some surgical strikes for some very targeted changes um, to the plans, projects, and investment mix. Um, some concepts here that we're testing to see what you know, what effect they have or what potential GHG benefit they would have is refocusing the scope of some of the capacity projects in the plan to emphasize complete streets, multimodal, safety retrofits, things that help accomplish the project purpose, but also help, you know, from the GHG emission reduction perspective. Um, in particular, we're looking at potentially advancing some BRT corridors. Uh, recall that in the original 2050 plan that we adopted last year, we had a very robust bus rapid transit network um, in the range of 10 to 12 distinct BRT corridors that we were going to implement maybe one every five years or so over the life of the plan over the 30 years to really build up a BRT network. Um, we're really looking at advancing some of those corridors so that we can accomplish them sooner um, and capture the GHG benefits of those projects sooner. 
And then um, the third thing here, the third bullet is that when we make some of these project specific changes, one of the other things that we want to do is we also want to increase investment in those multimodal programmatic improvements. We want to complete more of those things and we want to do them more quickly. So some of those programmatic investments that we've been talking about around safety, uh, bike pad, uh, transit, other multimodal complete street retrofits, um, those sorts of things. We know from our technical analysis that the more of those things that we can do and the more quickly we can do them will really help uh, meet our emissions reduction targets, particularly for the year 2030, um, which is a year that we're really focusing on of, of trying to be able to meet um, those targets, although obviously we need to do that uh, for all of the analysis years. So we're testing, you know, we're testing these concepts right now. We're working through it on the technical side. Um, our initial analysis is showing that it does help. Um, and it's really going to take a constellation of strategies, everything that we've been talking about so far today and more. Um, but even this step, when we add this, you know, sort of added it on top of everything we've been talking about, we know that this won't completely quite get us there as, as well in terms of closing the gap. So that leads us to kind of the final topic for today, a um, couple of things that we're looking at. Um, the first kind of thing here, the near-term land use forecast adjustments, I want to be clear in our language, this is not a strategy to close uh, the GHG emission reduction uh, target gaps. However, um, in our technical assessment of this work and our technical assessment of the plan, one of the things that we've been looking at is that when we originally prepared the 2050 RTP, you know, a couple years now, and we did the land use forecasting um, and the modeling associated with that, um, you know, again, the land use forecasts are in the model. That's a key planning input. It's a key federal requirement for a multimodal long range transportation plan. What we've realized now that we've had a couple of years to kind of, you know, have some initial hindsight on that is that the world is actually developing just a little bit differently and frankly, a little bit more um, higher residential density, particularly in Denver, but also several locations around the region. And I think, you know, we've all seen kind of those multifamily apartment complexes. Um, other sort of, um, you know, residential higher density dwelling units coming in that weren't part of our original forecast. So we're seeing in the real world that um, development is occurring a little bit differently, more densely, again, particularly on the residential side, um, and forecast are anticipated to do so at least over the next couple of years than we had originally accounted for in our forecasts. So we think it's reasonable and legitimate to kind of test that and see if we make what we call those near-term adjustments to our land use forecasts that we use in the regional transportation plan, how does that affect the remaining uh, GHG gap? Again, not a strategy to close it, but it's the idea that if we're seeing something in the real world, we ought to actually reflect that in our planning process. Um, finally, as it notes here, it doesn't affect, that work doesn't affect our federal air quality conformity model runs that we do for our federal requirements, um, but those can be incorporated later um, in a later amendment cycle. So that's one sort of bucket of things that we're looking at. Kind of the final thing that I want to touch on with you today is a provision in um, the state greenhouse gas rulemaking or in the rule um, that talks about mitigation measures. Um, these are directly from the rule. Um, they're defined, it says pending, but it's actually now adopted. Uh, CDOT's adopted policy directive 1610. Uh, we've been part of a statewide stakeholder group that's been working to uh, define and kind of score specific mitigation measures. So this gets a little confusing, but in a nutshell, mitigation measures are things that are done in our case outside kind of a modeling environment and outside of a plan environment. There are specific strategies, they're kind of policy oriented, qualitative oriented, they're very important things, but they're things that we wouldn't necessarily model, but they're very specific things where the stakeholder group and now the rule, the policy directive um, has come up with kind of scores. If you do sort of X, Y, Z, then policy directive 1610 sort of gives scoring for how much credit um, you get for GHG reduction. So as I note here, that exercise is kind of separate from our focus model, but it's another tool in the toolbox that we're starting to look at to be able to close the gap, the remaining gap on our emission reduction targets. From the GHG rule, there's several requirements associated with these mitigation measures. They must be specific, obviously, they must be measurable, they must be effective, of course, and they must be something that um, if you select one of these, one or more of these measures, um, you track them over time, you actually report on progress. Um, if we were to go down the mitigation measure route, uh, we would actually, uh, the board would adopt a mitigation action plan as part of the revised 2050 RTP, where we would say what specific mitigation measures uh, we want to uh, employ as a region, um, and we would track those over time for important progress of implementing uh, those mitigation measures. So we're just somewhat at the beginning of this, but um, as staff, we're exploring a couple things related to parking requirements and zoning related density increases near rapid transit stations. Um, so we're exploring the potential effectiveness of those 
consistent with policy directive 1610 to see if those would be effective mitigation measures for this region and if they would help us close the remaining GHG emission reduction gap. So um, almost to the end here, I know that's a lot of information, just wanna close with some other considerations around this work. Um, I do wanna be clear and I wanna be transparent with all of you that it's looking like based on our analysis that without mitigation measures, the other strategies that I've talked about today may not be enough to close the GHG emission reduction gap. Um, and that's why we're looking at mitigation measures to see if we can find some effective measures to get us 100% of the way there. Um, an alternative to mitigation measures, again, this comes from the rule. Um, if for some reason we didn't want to adopt mitigation measures or we didn't want to adopt a mitigation action plan and we didn't meet the GHG emission reduction targets um, from the GHG rule, project eligibility restrictions on federal funds within the Dr. Cog MPO area would be affected. Um, and that comes straight from the rule. Um, it would affect some of those federal funding sources. And specifically, as noted here, it would affect project eligibility uh, for the 24 to 27 TIP that we're, we're starting to work on. Uh, those are calls three and four that would occur late this year and early next year. So it would affect our TIP process. And those restrictions, if we got to that point, would also affect CDOT project funding eligibility within our Dr. Cog MPO area. Um, so I just want to be honest and transparent with you about those implications in the context of why we're looking at so many different strategies and tools in the toolbox to try and um, close and fully meet the emission reduction targets uh, within the GHG rule. So once again, just to kind of show you this now that, now that I've given you all of that context, um, again, we've already talked about number one. Uh, we've talked about number two in previous meetings. So as indicated on this slide, where we are now is at number three, looking at some project specific changes in the investment mix in the plan and starting to look at um, GHG mitigation measures and near-term land use forecast adjustments in our plan um, as sort of the final analysis steps uh, to see where that gets us in terms of the emission reduction targets. So with that, that's my last slide. I know that was an awful lot. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the work you're doing and, and helping us understand this as much as possible. I really appreciate that as I'm sure there are other directors do as well. Uh, Director Moldy. Hi, I had to find my unmute. Jacob, thank you so much for this. Um, you know, I really appreciate all the detail because as we delve into our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, there's, there is so much to learn and there is so much to figure out and reading all of this to understand what you all have to do to try to figure out how we can meet these goals. It really hit home exactly what you have to do. So I have a great appreciation for it now, uh, more so. Um, what I wanted to ask, um, a little bit of comment, a little bit of ask, and I appreciate that it's brought to us in a work session because there's a lot to digest. And I started to look through 1610. And um, what I wanted to understand, and I might understand it as I look into it more, is for the land use changes that there might be for a relatively small municipality, and a lot of us are here, would the changes in the mitigation adjustments that would be tracked, would they be forward-looking only, or would we be able to um, track something that's already begun and is in, an, in the implementation phase? So for example, some of us, you know, I'll use Lone Tree and Castle Pines as examples. We've got large planned areas where the zoning's already taken place. We've already accounted for some of this. Um, put in some high density requirements. We may plan for some more. We may be able to make adjustments, but you can't, there's only so much space to be had and it's already around some of that transit. So the question would be, as we approach the idea of doing something like this, uh, could we account for being able to implement this tracking on something that's already planned for because it will be an implementation and a monitoring over time. And then the second question is, um, again, it might be addressed in the 1610, which is a pretty large document. Um, would, who would really be implementing and paying for the tracking and would it be by air testing and for a small municipality that might be 
a high, big lift? And would part of the funding apply to that? And those would be my considerations to think about. Thank you. Yeah, those are great questions, Director Mulvey, so let me try to answer them. Um, first, let me start out, I should have said in the presentation, let me acknowledge there's a whole team of people, really smart people, much smarter than me, working on this. And I actually do want to take just a second to acknowledge all the staff in multiple divisions at Dr. Cogg are doing this work. Um, it's it's really taking a team to do this, and um, certainly not just me. It's it's really a lot of other smart people doing this. So I want to thank the team um, publicly and let you all know that there's a lot of really smart people working on this. Um, Director Mulvey, for your specific questions, uh, let me try and answer them in this way. First, let me draw the distinction between the land use forecast adjustments and the mitigation measures, even though they both say land use in them. The idea, and, and to get to your point, if we know that something has recently gone in the ground or it's about to go in the ground, something that's pretty tangible, you know, something that's approved under construction, recently opened, whatever it is, um, from a development perspective, say an apartment complex or whatever it may be, that's what we're trying to capture in the potential near-term land use forecast adjustments because those are those are known things. Those are things that are happening. As you said, they're in the pipeline. You know, and we should we should get credit for that. I mean, that's legitimate. If we know that the world is developing a little bit different than we originally forecasted two or three years ago, then we think it's legitimate to include that in um, in our planning assumptions. Going forward from that, you know, sort of sort of in the near term, let's say the next you know, five years or so just to pick a time frame, but, you know, sort of beyond the immediate time, that's what the potential mitigation measures would be focused on. So they're future oriented. And if we do them, our approach is something that's regional, um, something that Dr. Cog's staff would probably take the lead in tracking. It's something the board would adopt as part of the mitigation action plan. We would need to report on it um, to meet the state rule requirements, but it's something that as Dr. Cog's staff, presumably we take the lead in tracking, but we would set it up in a way that's as regional in nature, as easy to sort of track and follow over time as possible. And I would draw an analogy to our Metro Vision plan. Um, if you think of the targets in Metro Vision and particularly the local and regional um, actions that are specified in, in Metro Vision, those are meant to be you know, regional things. We don't assign them by jurisdiction. Uh, we don't account for them by jurisdiction. It's a regional approach and that's the way the GHG rule is set up as well. Um, and that's how we would sort of structure that if we do it and how we track them over time. Does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. And and I, I too appreciate that this is an ongoing process for us all to think about and consider in this work session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Spear. Thank you um, for this really wonderful presentation, all the work that you all are doing on this. Um, I have a few questions. I'll just ask them one at a time. <laughs> Make it a little easier. Um, the uh, mitigation um, plan, kind of going that option, it seems like there's there, there may be an extensive adoption um, and reporting process. Do you expect that that would delay um, the allocation of a call three or um, the third and fourth tip calls at all? I think the short answer to that is no, but just to okay. kind of clarify that is if we go the mitigation mitigation measures route, um, that does that does trigger some things, you know, sort of some some procedural things. Um, the board would have to adopt a mitigation action plan, as I said, um, so we'd have to prepare that. That would have to occur by October first as well. Um, so it's something that you know we're kind of gearing up for with the anticipation that that's probably potentially what may happen. Um, again, if we can find the mitigation measures that make sense to do this right, um, but it would trigger those requirements to specify those measures put them in a mitigation action plan. The board would need to adopt that. We need to start tracking it. But all of those sorts of things on the front end of, of preparing that and going through that would be part and parcel of the work that we would do as part of the revised 2050 RTP that we need to complete by October 1st. Once that's done, once we get through that point, if that's the route that we go down, the tracking of it over time, something we would have to report on annually and that's specified in the rule about how and when we do that. Um, but I don't believe that that directly would relate to or in any way delay the tip calls. Um, but Ron, I will defer to you if you want to add to that. No, I think that I think that's right, Jacob. Hi, hi everybody, Ron Papsdorf. Um, I, I think if if the board adopts a mitigation action plan as part of the review of the RTP in order to comply with the rules, um, greenhouse gas reduction levels, then um, that shouldn't have any significant impact on the overall schedule for tips, uh, tip calls three and four. 
Thank you. Um, and just a related question, you answered uh, part of it. Um, I was just wondering about the timeline for kind of developing um, some of these outcomes and some of the specific um, actions that you're currently exploring for the mitigation plan. Um, I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity for cities and counties to weigh in and if you could just talk a little bit about um, the engagement process for um, arriving at some of those, um, some of the measures in the plan. Right. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Ad admittedly, this is all moving really quickly, um, being driven by that state deadline of October 1st. I, we all wish we had more time. Um, so right now where we're at is we're doing some technical testing and analysis and modeling to see if those mitigation measures, the ones that I talked about, uh, the parking and the residential density, do those things make sense? Do they make a difference? Are they effective? Do they seem to fit for this region? Um, so we're still kind of that initial exploratory um, stage. To be frank, where we hope to be is by the time we have um, the July board work session, and I'm sorry to make you meet, it's gonna be my fault, so I'll sign up for it meet, um, at this meeting. Um, but in July, we need to meet with you because by that point, we do hope to have a better sense of, do we need to go that route? Presuming we do um, the mitigation measures route, what would those kind of final mitigation measures look like? And give you all a chance to kind of weigh in on that and discuss that um, because that become then becomes part of the work that we bring forward as we get into our you know 30 day public comment period and the adoption process for the plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then last question, um, is there an option for um, taking the mitigation plan as well as um, looking at changes to the tip criteria i mean are we sort of an anything as possible kind of moment or are you really just thinking about going in one direction or the other um let me start an answer and ask ron to, to um, help supplement on the near term because we're focused on meeting the requirements of the rule the near term the first test is can we find one or more mitigation measures that help close the gap and help the 2050 rtp meet the rule depending on you know presuming we go forward on that route and select one or more mitigation measures um, that help us do that, and that's kind of the first hurdle to overcome. Then let me turn it over to talk to Ron, or to have, sorry, <laughs> to have Ron talk about the implications for the TIP process moving forward if we do that. Yep, uh, thanks, Director Spear. Um, at, at this point, we don't see a need to, assuming we meet the reduction levels either through the planning review process or and, and or combined with a mitigation action plan, we don't see a need to review the TIP criteria. I think the TIP criteria are, are really solid, right? And they're leading to good decisions. I think as you all saw when you allocated $40 million, the first $40 million tranche of funds through the stage stage one, um, we two third over two thirds of the money is that we're allocating through this TIP process is strictly res, is restricted to only bike, ped, transit, relate those kinds of types of projects. So uh, if we think the criteria is really solid. We think that represents a good bit of work. Now, if we get to the point where we are not meeting the reduction levels and the board is not willing to adopt a mitigation action plan that would close a final gap towards uh, uh, achieving the reduction levels, then we'd have to, and why we structured the, this TIP process the way we did, that's when we would have to revisit the TIP criteria and um, uh, in the context of the restrictions on um, eligible uses of uh, some of the funds that are allocated through calls three and four in the TIP cycle. Wonderful, thank you. I appreciate your answering all my questions. Director Maurer, your hand was up. Do you have a question or did that get answered? Um, it got answered, that was great. Um, thanks, Ron, and um, thanks, Jacob. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Rex. I was trying to chew fast enough that I wouldn't have food in my mouth. <laughs> but I was afraid I was gonna miss the opportunity. So um, I just wanted to, to just ask staff, and, and I know you talked about this a little bit, Jacob, but with regards to the next steps, and um, what we're bringing back to the board. So what can they expect to see the next time they see this, this comes back around? Yeah, honestly, so our, at our next opportunity with you, your July board work session, we hope to and frankly need to have more definition around um, kind of the final testing, the programmatic investments, project specific changes, and particularly the mitigation measures that we might be considering, um, because that's going to be your final chance in this environment to kind of talk through that with us so that we can prepare all of those materials for what we're planning to be starting a mid-July 30-day uh, public comment period through mid-August. 
Um, that needs to happen so that we can then start our adoption process in late August and bring this to the board in September. So it's kind of a nutshell of the road ahead. Thank you, sir. Other questions, comments? Mr. Mr. Chair, this is Ron. Yes, sir. If, if, you, if you'll allow me just to, just to speak a little bit to the um, timing and engagement question from Director Spear and, and sort of related to um, Doug's, Doug's point about the, the, the schedule. Um, we, we have briefed the city and county managers group um, back at their meeting in May on sort of this level of, of discussion. And we're in the process of scheduling a follow-up conversation with them uh, in the second half of June, uh, as we sort of develop. So we're trying to keep your staffs involved. We're, we're, we're very uh, intentionally briefing the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, to get input into this process as well. So we're, we're engaging your communities at, at the staff level, as well as you um, at, at the board level here. Um, I, did, I did wanna speak just a little bit um, more about mitigation measures, because I don't want you to leave tonight thinking that we we might we might that we're thinking of anything that might apply evenly across the full extent of the region um, because that probably doesn't make sense um, very much like metrovision uh, there are there you know there are different effective measures that that are that are more or less effective in different parts of the region and so, you know, we want to be strategic. We want to do things that are going to make sense for the region that help us meet the reduction levels, um, but focused on focus on those opportunities that exist. Um, playing off in past investments and future investments in transportation, like the light rail system, like the planned BRT system, um, about you know maybe revisiting some standards in station areas. Um, in pedestrian focus areas. So being very strategic, not sort of just blanket approaches across the region, because we don't think that makes a lot of sense. I'd appreciate that addition. Other comments, questions? All right. Uh, our next meeting is July 6th, correct? And with that, sorry about that, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, so any other announcements, any other things before we adjourn? Mr. Chairman, I just might point out that our, our next scheduled meeting of the board is on, is on June 15th. Uh, right. But the next work session, of course, yes. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> I appreciate that. Good. With that, thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. See you in a couple of weeks. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.